Dr. Tillman Neckpin is going to tell us, as I told you before, about Joshua Hill, the self-proclaimed king of Pitcairn Island. Dr. Neckman was born in Wiesbaden, Germany, and raised in Augusta, Georgia. How is that for a contrast? He has degrees from Georgetown University, Claremont Graduate University, and from the University of Southern California, he has his PhD. His discipline is British Imperial History, and is now, he's now an associate professor of British and British Imperial History at Skidmore College in Saratoga Springs, New York. I'm fascinated by the subject, and I can't wait to hear him tell us about Joshua Hill, the self-instituted king of Pitcairn Island. Thank you for that, Barbara. And thank you again to Herb and to Ted, both for organizing the conference and for letting me come. This is a very new research project for me. I've just come off of some research on India, and I didn't expect anyone would want to hear this project this early, so thank you. And I will say particularly thank you to whoever put me right after the video conference, because I feel really intimidated by that. Um, so, uh, Joshua Hill. On October 28, 1832, an enigmatic man, then aged 59, landed at Pitcairn Island. It was a Sunday. Joshua W. Hill had sailed from Tahiti, more than 1,300 nautical miles to the northeast of the tiny Pacific island best known as the home of, to the descendants of the mutineers from HMAV Bounty and its ill-fated breadfruit mission under Lieutenant William Bly. There is no accurate record of Hill's actual landing in Bounty Bay, though we know quite a great deal about what Hill made of things upon the island upon first entering Adamstown. He didn't care for what he found. The island, he later noted, was, quote, in the greatest state of irregularity. Most of the islanders were drunk, including one Englishman by the name of George Hun Nobbs, who was the island's pastor, end quote. If we believe Hill and his partisans, what happened next was simple. He convinced the Pitkerners that they were in need of reform, volunteering his servants as an agent of change to the island. His detractors, though, tell a rather different story. George Nobbs would later recall that Hill announced that he had been sent in an official capacity by London to, quote, adjust the internal affairs of the island. Furthermore, his authority was buttressed by British ships of war off the coast that were under his direction. There were, of course, no boats. There were no orders. Though Joshua Hill had tried to convince the British government and the London Missionary Society to involve him in several salvic plans for the island, neither had done so. He seems, therefore, to have arrived on the island of his own accord. He was but one man, and yet from 1832 until his removal from the island late in 1837, Joshua Hill veritably ruled at Pitcairn as the island's high priest, its president, and its school teacher. As a veritable dictator over the Pitkerners, he would attempt to reform their uh, system of land ownership. He would institute a temperance society. He broke up stills and founded schools, most of that at the gunpoint. He established new religious policies, uh, and he sought to reform the manners of a community of people whose moral fate he believed was on the brink. He managed, in short, to dislodge Pitcairn Island from any form of authorized British colonial control. And this was, I want to remind everyone, at exactly the moment when the British Empire, more broadly, was nearing its global heyday. But who was Joshua W. Hill? Where exactly had he come from? Why did he decide that Pitcairn Island ought to be the ultimate target of his, and this is my favorite quote, his philanthropic tour among the various islands of the Pacific? Few who have looked into the history of Pitcairn Island have ventured to ask any of these questions about this very interesting man. Nearly everyone who's written about him, and it's usually a paragraph for a couple of sentences in a broader book, um, has written about Hill, tends to assume that all of the things he said about himself were lies. We do know that there was one whopper there. And they have concluded as a result that it is nearly impossible to know much about this Pacific fraud. I want to start from a different premise. Let us imagine that there is more to this story than one imposter, three score gullible Pacific Islanders, and a half decade of British colonial neglect on London's part. Let us assume that Joshua Hill was connected to bigger colonial concerns, as he claimed he was. 
that he did have global connections and that his arrival at Pitcairn was part of a larger, if still idiosyncratic, sense of how to reform and refortify British imperialism all around the world. Let us assume, in short, that Joshua Hill had a reason to go to Pitcairn Island. After all, in 1832, as today, one doesn't end up at Pitcairn by accident. Sir George Eliot has left us with what may be the only image of Joshua Hill. It's a faded, vague pencil drawing that shows an older man with a balding head, flabby jowls, and small, round glasses. The picture is labeled Joshua Hill, the self-instituted king of Pitcairn Island, which I've taken as my title today. And that label is telling, for it implies a certain lunacy on Hill's part. He's crazy. He's a madman. He thinks he's a king. To be sure, Hill's governance at Pitcairn lacked any form of authority other than that which Hill himself asserted. So on one level, he was a self-instituted king. But was he actually crazy? Nearly everyone who's written about him has assumed that the answer is yes. Most books go far as to brandish words like megalomaniac, paranoid, schizophrenic, delusional, and eccentric in reference to Hill and his time at Pitcairn. Now, the objective record is rather clear here, so I don't want to spend the rest of my time defending this guy, right? He, his authoritarian regime at Pitcairn was so abusive that the islanders were clearly better off rid of him when he was packed on board the HMS Imogene by Captain Bruce late in 1837 and removed to Valparaiso, where he disappeared into history, although I have subsequently determined he did go back to London and was buried at Old St. Pancras Church right behind what is today Euston Station. But before we dismiss Hill as a mere madman, perhaps we would do well to compare him to other men who claimed leadership status at Pitcairn. Say, for example, the very venerable George Hunn Nobbs, and here I want to build on what Herb started when he talked about Nobbs earlier. I'm also following here a pattern that was established by Raymond Nobbs, who has written a very good biography of George Nobbs, who also happens to be Raymond Nobbs' great-great-grandfather. When he arrived at Pitcairn on October 28, 1828, four years to the day before Hill's arrival, George Nobbs' background was no less dubious than was Hill's. As would Joshua Hill, Nobbs told extravagant stories about himself when he landed for the first time, stories that included his being the illegitimate son of a British nobleman. There was no proof to his claims. Indeed, there were more questions than anything else. Who was he? Who was this American guy he had sailed to Pitcairn with, this Noah Bunker? How had the two men come by the boat they arrived in, and why had they sailed it to Pitcairn? What authority did they have to come to Pitcairn in the first place, and then, moreover, to offer their services as teachers on the island? After all, Pitcairn already had a teacher in John Buffett, whose arrival five years before was also somewhat murky. The old adage, however, tells us that history gets written by the victors. And in Pitcairn's history, George Hun Nobbs is a victor. His esteemed leadership of the island in the 1840s, his celebrated trip to London in the early 1850s to be ordained as a priest, a trip that included an audience with Queen Victoria and Prince Albert at Osborne House, his role in the removal to Norfolk Island in, 18, in the 1850s, and his continued leadership of the Pitcairn community there until his death in 1884, all served to cloak the mysteries of his arrival and to legitimate his past. Joshua Hill doesn't get any of that. In point of fact, to read Raymond Nobbs' biography of George Hun Nobbs is to read a story that matches the biography of Hill, or at least the one he told about himself, in striking detail. Both men had connections with missionary establishments in Britain. Both had served in naval capacities in the chaotic South American wars for independence. Both had been in service in the East. Both arrived at Pitcairn for dubious reasons and without any clear authority. Both were unhappy with the way they found things, and both decided to take control of the island and its residents to make things better. All of these similarities, I suggest, beg us to pay more attention to Hill than we've done before. To get at Hill's biography is not actually as difficult as we might at first imagine it to be. Anyone who spent any time looking at Joshua Hill knows that he was more than willing to talk about himself. I can imagine him being deeply annoying, in fact. The biographical claims he made for himself are a legend, but the key to unlocking Hill's past is to trust the things he said about himself and to trust that they were true, even though we know that the one big thing he said was absolutely a lie. According to Captain Charles Fremantle of HMS Challenger, who touched at Pitcairn in 1833, only a few months after Hill's arrival, the curriculum vitae that Hill offered as his bona fides told the story of a peripatetic 60 or so years. 
By his own admission, Hill had, and this is a quote, in the course of a long life, passed among the various foreign dependencies of Great Britain, visited many of the islands in the Pacific Ocean, end quote. His travels had brought him into contact with and communication with the rich and the famous. He had rubbed elbows with the rich and, um, and noses with the famous, to be precise. He knew William Wilberforce, the great abolitionist, as well as Captain J.W. Beachy, whose 1825 voyage on the Blossom had famously stopped at Pitcairn. He had, he boasted, quote, visited the four quadrants of the globe, end quote, and he had done so in style. He had lived and dined in palaces and with no less than the likes of Madame Bonaparte and Lady Hamilton, mistress to the great Lord Nelson. He was friends with George IV and William IV. He had been a guest at meetings of the Royal Society and was an associate of its president, Sir Joseph Banks, whose idea it had been to send Captain Bly on his ill-fated breadfruit mission in the first place. He had published in some of the leading newspapers of the day and visited some of the great tourist destinations, not only in Europe, but also in South Asia and North America. He had sampled some of the finest wines at the tables of royal hosts across Europe, and he was, perhaps hypocritically, a member of various temperance societies. He attended Napoleon's coronation. These were at least some of the claims he used to impress the Pitkerners. There is hardly enough time here for me to recount all that I found out about Hill's pre-Pitkern life, to say nothing of the ongoing, what I'm calling global manhunt, that has been required to connect the dots Hill offered in his extravagant autobiographical claims. I trust then that it will suffice to offer a quick glimpse into some of Hill's biography, at least the parts that I think I've confirmed as true or more or less likely to be true, and then to offer some further reflections on what his biography tells us more broadly about the place of Pitkern in 19th century British imperial history, and that's something that's very dear to me as an academic historian, because most academic historians will tell you Pitkern is too small to actually matter. They want to study places like India or Canada or Australia, the bigger chunks of the empire, and I think Pitkern actually tells us a different story if we trust it to. Joshua Hill claimed to have been born in, on April 15, 1773 in colonial North America and that his father was an American loyalist, a man of property who lost everything as a result of his support for the crown in the revolutionary crisis. Crown loyalists have, for their part, received renewed attention thanks in no small part to a book by Maya Jansenoff entitled Liberty's Exiles, a book that was written with the help of records left behind by the British government's official efforts to repay loyalists for their losses they suffered in the service of the crown during the American War. The list of names included in those records includes many a hill. Very few of them were men of property. None of them, indeed, match the description Hill offers of his father's holdings prior to the American War or the timeline of his father's departure for North America. None, that is, except a Delaware man by the name of Joshua Hill. If Joshua Hill of Delaware was, in fact, our Joshua Hill's father, he was not originally a crown loyalist, a lie in the family tree. Imagine that. Indeed, he served in the Delaware colonial, later state legislature, and was loyal to the Continental Congress up until 1778. In that year, he seems to have spoken ill-advisedly about the Congress in critical terms, whereupon a small armed band was sent to arrest him for his disloyal and intemperate remarks. Sounds a lot like Joshua. In the kerfuffle that followed, two of the soldiers sent against him were killed. Now, having taken arms against the American cause, Hill fled to the British side, eventually leaving the rebellious colonies for Canada, from whence he eventually made his way back to Britain. None of the documents related to Delaware's Joshua Hill specifically mention a son named Joshua, though they do mention several sons. But then again, none of these records would have been public in the 1830s when Joshua Hill began telling his lies. Could Hill have fabricated the connection? Yes, certainly. But the overlap between his stories and this one loyalist history would be uncanny, perhaps even improbable, if the two men didn't actually have some familial connection. Likewise, it's hard to confirm Hill's claim that he published in some of the leading newspapers of the day. His one concrete publication claim was that he had written an essay on naval affairs that appeared in the Morning Post on March 7th, 1811, and he gives us that date. A quick survey of the microfilm reels from this once venerable news source verifies that there was a rather lengthy editorial essay on naval affairs published that day. But, as was customary in the period, there is no byline for the essay, so we cannot say for certain whether Joshua Hill wrote the essay. Of course, he made the claim in 1840, some 30 years after the essay was published, leaving us to wonder. 
How was his claim so accurate? Had he appreciated the essay when he first read it three decades early and remembered its publication details specifically on the off chance that he might later use it in an elaborate autobiographical fib? Had he searched through the newspaper archives at the British Museum, which would have been open to him, to add some historical flourish to his fable? Or was the claim simply true? My inclination as a historian here is to say that the simplest answer may be the best one and that this may well be an essay by Joshua Hill. If I cannot tell you some parts of Hill's life with any certainty, I can be sure about other aspects of his life. Did he visit the four quadrants of the globe? Yes. By the time he arrived at Pitcairn Island in 1832, Joshua Hill had traveled in Europe, South America, North America, and East Asia. The archival record notes his presence in each of these places. Had he dined in palaces? Yes, again. Records indicate that at minimum, Hill died at Brighton Pavilion at least once on November 23, 1817, the, year, the weekend after the Prince Regent's daughter had passed away, as the guest of the Prince Regent himself, the future George IV. His younger brother, the future William IV, was a guest at the dinner. So Hill had met these two British monarchs, even if his claims to be their friend was overstated. Hill's claims to well-connected friendships, though, went beyond the British monarchy. His list of friends included the likes of Joseph Banks, and indeed the collected letters of Joseph Banks' archive include letters from Dr. Charles, Dr. Sir Charles Blagden dated from the summer of 1802 that indicate that Blagden, then the secretary for the British Royal Society, introduced one J. Hill to the Institut de Francais at Banks' request. Not only did these records prove that Hill knew Banks, they also confirm his claims to have been familiar with leading members of the Royal Society in Britain and a guest to similar learned societies across Europe. Given that Hill's claims to have lived in Paris for five years, his arrival in 1802 meant that he would have been in the city at the time of Napoleon's coronation in 1804, even if he didn't attend the event as an invited guest, as his lofty claims suggest, he may well have been there on the streets to participate in the festivities that surrounded the coronation itself. Similarly, given that Charles Blagden records a visit to Madame Bonaparte only days after having introduced Hill at the Institut de Francais, it is not impossible to imagine that Hill's connected British associates won him some sort of admission to Josephine's home at the Chateau de Malmaison. Not dissimilarly, East India Company records indicate that one Joshua Hill sailed on board the East Indiaman Bridgewater in 1794. That ship sailed from India to China. In his own retelling, Joshua Hill was a crewman in the largest fleet ever to sail to the east. And while his estimation of the size of the convoy is inaccurate here, the East India Company sent much bigger convoys than this one, the dates of his claim match the company's records exactly. More significantly, this record confirms the employment claim that Hill was making to the Pitkerners when he told them that he had worked for the East India Company. For ultimately, what Joshua Hill was doing when he rattled off this list of accomplishments was, yes, bragging to a degree, but he also wanted to give them a kind of, or to convince him rather, that he was the kind of person London sorry, would have put in charge of Pitkern Island, and he wanted them to believe he had the credentials to do the job. And it is not unreasonable to argue that Hill's various experiences in the Pacific en route to Pitcairn were exactly the sorts of things that London might have been looking for in a potential colonial administrator had London actually been looking for a potential colonial administrator for Pitcairn Island. When he arrived in Tahiti in January 1832, for instance, Hill found that George Pritchard was absent from the island. Pritchard, an agent for the London Missionary Society, had lived at Tahiti since 1824 and had become an invaluable advisor to Queen Pomare IV. In 1837, London would tap him to be the first official British consul at Tahiti. Without the guidance of Pritchard, though, Queen Pomare was deeply engaged in what appeared to be a losing battle with Euro-American whalers who wanted permission to land at Tahiti in search of alcohol and sex. In letters to the British Crown, Pomare noted that her government was in great need of London support, particularly in the form of an official British agent. Pomare went so far as to name the person she felt best suited to do the job, one Captain Joshua Hill, who had been working with her to help secure the sovereign shores of her island during his recent residence. Of course, she understood that Captain Hill had bigger things to do with his trip across the Pacific, and she made sure that Britain knew that her second choice was George Pritchard. If it is true then that Hill assisted British interests at Tahiti during his stay there in 1831 and 2, and you'll note he knew enough about Pitcairn to know that when he wanted to find the Pitkerners in 1831 and 32, you didn't go to Pitcairn, you went to Tahiti where they'd been removed, although he was slightly behind, they'd already gone home. 
It is also true that he was able to support the missionary efforts of Hiram Bingham of the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, who was as connected to the Hawaiian monarchy as was George Pritchard to the Tahitian. Surviving letters and diaries from Bingham indicate that Joshua Hill arrived in Honolulu in June 1831, just as a group of French Catholic missionaries were causing tensions, both because the American missionaries feared for their evangelical turf and because the Hawaiian monarchy wanted to secure its sovereign borders against further European missionary intervention. When the Catholic priests demanded permission to land and establish themselves at the Hawaiian chain against the wishes of King Kamehameha III, it was Hill who was able to convince them that they would do well to seek souls on one of the many other Pacific islands where there was no missionary presence. It was his pragmatic sense that the American missionaries under Bingham had things under control and were trying to do the same work that the Catholics hoped to do that finally convinced the French priests to leave and thereby avoided a potential conflict. It was a situation that required a neutral arbiter and Hill played the part perfectly. It's the, about the only time I've ever seen that Joshua Hill shows up somewhere and makes peace. Much of what Joshua Hill told the Pitcairn Islanders about himself was therefore true. This has been the great biographical discovery of my research and of my willingness to believe a man I know to have been a liar, at least relative to that claim about his rights to administer at Pitcairn. A lot of history, though, gets written and lost between absolute truth and absolute fiction. And that middle ground is where we find a lot of Hill's biography. Did he, as he claimed, have a French cook, a box at the opera, ride in the carriages of dukes, dine with governors, viceroys, and admirals, visit Niagara Falls, the natural bridge in Virginia, or the reciprocating fountain in East Tennessee, live for a time among the Seneca Indians as a friend of the noted orator Red Jacket, was he at the only performance to feature three generations of the famous French ballet dynasty, the Vestrices? In each of these instances, the answer is a definite maybe. These claims are all vague enough that to try to track them in the historical archive would be to hunt for ghosts. Take, for instance, the singular claim about the Vestris family. The celebrated French ballet dancer, Gaetano Vestris, returned from retirement in 1800 to dance one final performance alongside his son, Auguste, and his grandson, Armand, who, both of whom were well-respected dance legends in their own generations at the Opera de Paris. If we take Charles Blagden's claim that Hill had only just arrived in Paris back in 1802 when we talked about the Royal Society, then we have to imagine that Hill traveled to Paris several times in his life to see this 1800 performance. Did he? We probably will never know, though there is something again to be made for Hill's uncanny ability to make claims about his own past that he had been at this most singular of ballet performances that matched the historical record so perfectly. And that is just the point here. Each of Hill's claims resonates with what we know for certain about his biography, just enough that it could be true. He did live in Paris for a time, so it is not hard to imagine that he had a French chef and a box at the Paris Opera. He dined at Brighton with the Prince Regent, so he may well have been part of social groups that included governors, viceroys, and admirals. If he was born in North America, as he claims, then it is possible he saw Niagara Falls and what we now call the reciprocating spring, not fountain, in Tennessee. For these were hydraulic wonders to men of learning in the 19th century and tourist destinations for the broader public. Red Jacket lived near Niagara Falls among the Seneca, so if Hill went to Niagara, there's no reason to think he didn't meet Red Jacket as well. To know for certain is all but impossible. And yet, when placed in the context of what we know to be true about Hill's life, these claims now seem less arrogant, less bombastic, and, well, less insane. What I've sketched here is a brief survey of my admittedly early efforts to write as definitive a biography of Joshua Hill as I possibly can. But what does this tell us more broadly? Is there any value to knowing Hill beyond simply filling in details about a brief six-year period in the history of a very small Pacific island? I think the answer is that there is more to this story. Hill, not unlike George Horn Nobbs, targeted Pitcairn. He had written letters to the government and to the London Missionary Society about the island prior to his voyage there. He had tracked the efforts to remove the islanders to Tahiti, at least as I pointed out, enough that he knew that they wouldn't be at Pitcairn, but rather at Tahiti in 1831. But why? What attracted men with such global connections, with connections to Britain's worldwide empire, with friends in high places, and with the power to go wherever they wanted to Pitcairn? I think Hill's biography begins to help us frame some answers. Obviously, Pitcairn was famous for its romantic connections to the events on board the Bounty in April 1789. In the 19th century, it was also romanticized in broader imperial connections. 
Nearly every account of the island, whether by visiting sailor or historical author, told a tale in which the founding act of mutiny and the subsequent brutal crimes, the kidnapping of Tahitian women or the murderous events of 1793 that witnessed the deaths of so many of the island's male population, were expunged by the utopian world that Alexander Smith or John Adams, here we find another person willing to tell tales about his past, had forged in the years between 1793 and 1808 when the American ship Topaz came upon the island. Nearly every 19th century account of Pitcairn tells of a religious paradise. John Orlebar, sailing as a midshipman on board HMS Syringa Patam under Captain Waldegrave, had a chance to observe Pitcairn in 1830 and can serve as an example. It was delightful to meet everywhere, he wrote, with the clear brow and smiling countenance of health and content. Their happiness centered in the bosom of their families and all the capabilities of living comfortable within their reach. Hallowed by religion, their lives must be one continued stream of uninterrupted blessings. If, as Patty O'Brien has argued elsewhere, it is almost possible to tell the entire history of the Pacific, at least as the West has viewed it, with and upon the eroticized bodies of Pacific women, that story is different at Pitcairn. Few, if any, of those who commented on Pitcairn in the 19th century cared one bit about the Tahitian women. This was the story of Adams and his redemptive work, and the story of the half-English, half-Tahitian offspring of the mutineers who had adopted the Englishman Adams as their patriarch. There was, to be sure, a hint here of noble savagery, the Pacific as this savage space that the British had made better, but it was also a world in which the British had done that work. In an age when the Pacific mattered, as perhaps the central imperial geography, competing with the British were the French, the Americans, and the Russians, Pitcairn was disproportionately important to the British. It was proof that their empire could change the world. It could make people better, whether they were again, this is 19th century imperial thinking, racially inferior others or criminal mutineers. The British influence could make the world a better place. And when we reflect more purposefully on the life and career, no matter how misguided, of Joshua Hill, we find that Pitcairn was not just a logical target for worldly colonial travelers like Hill or Nobbs or any of the other travelers who went there. It might actually become the perfect colonial target because it was the centerpiece of British imperialism in the Pacific, a place where if you were a colonial administrator or a would-be colonial administrator, it was a stage to stand on where the world spotlight shone on you. Thank you. <laughs>